<laughs> Thank you, Avi. Um, <clears throat> so I was a student here from um, uh, 1997 to 2001, and um, <clears throat> so I came here uh, many times. So when I when I when I tell people that um, I went to Princeton for school, especially to kids, when they would say, "Wow, that's very close to New York," <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, "Yeah, but unfortunately, I just didn't go there often. I, I enjoy having the opportunity to go in there, but I didn't go there often." And I will continue to say, uh, "Actually, I I'm." I regret more not coming to another great place called IAS. <laughs> uh, so if you are any, any student from Princeton here, see, mistakes are repeated there. <laughs> so I would encourage you uh, if, if they watch videos uh, to come here more regularly. And of course, the kids would get confused. Uh, IAS, what is that? I would say, that's where Einstein worked. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity here. Um, so I we so this is going to be a, a, about a, a, quant, a talk about quantum, and I hope that I could give a talk in a quantum way, so that I could speed it up uh, because there's so much material. Uh, but uh, earlier Avi said that uh, uh, I don't have to stop. Okay, I guess until I hear uh, the stomach start to uh, complain. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right, all right, all right. Uh, it's, it's, uh, this is about two papers. One is a John work uh, with Carl Miller, uh, who is a uh, research scientist at Michigan uh, with me. Another one is with uh, my former student, uh, Xiao Liu, who is a postdoc at MIT now, and a collaborator, Kai Min Chang, who is in uh, Taiwan. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, dis uh, describing uh, what I mean by randomness. Uh, randomness means a lot, uh, uh, a lot of different things, and mean different things to different people. And and I will uh, describe why it's difficult to get randomness in in real world and in theory. Okay, uh, and then uh, uh, I will try to convince you that uh, we should consider a quantum approach for generating randomness. So suppose we have a nb string x, and I say it is random if it cannot be perfectly uh, predicted. Okay. So therefore, uh, my notion of randomness is relative. Okay. Something that is random uh, to me uh, may not be uh, random uh, to you. So by perfectly randomness, uh, perfect randomness, I mean uh, it's uniformly uh, distributed. And so for uh, <coughs> randomness that is not perfect, so there are, there are two ways I will quantify them. Uh, one is by the deviation uh, to uniform randomness. And the other is this notion of uh, mean entropy. Uh, so an n k source. So n, remember n is the length of the string. And k is another parameter uh, that's no more than n. So n k source means that uh, uh, the best uh, chance of guessing those n bits is no more than 2 to the minus k. And, and this could be a quantum notion that uh, uh, the psi information you have could be quantum. And I'm going to talk about true randomness. And what I mean is that uh, those are random strings so that the error uh, is a function of some other parameter. And when that uh, uh, parameter goes to infinity, then this error is going to go to zero. And that's what I mean by true randomness. So we need, we need randomness, and we need a lot of them. You know, we need them for um, cryptography, uh, privacy, and uh, we need them for running fast algorithms um, and gambling. <laughs> um, and I think we need them a lot. Uh, so one terabyte is my estimation after consulting uh, my uh, uh, security uh, colleagues. And actually, most of the random bits are not used in keys. It turns out that every uh, uh, internet uh, uh, packet has a header. And the header is supposed to be uh, having an ID, which is a random number. And, and you may, so you can calculate how many Google searches and multiply by that by uh, 
uh, the random bits needs, need that, that are needed. So maybe one terabyte is, is an underestimation. We need a lot of them. So the question we started here is how can we obtain randomness? Okay. And here are the goals. We want to have high quality randomness. Uh, high quality means a small error and for crypto application, uh, it's a negligible error. And we want to, in some situations, we want to have information uh, theoretically uh, secure randomness. So it's secure, it's random, uniform, it's almost uniformly random uh, to all powerful quantum adversaries. And we need a lot and we need to get them uh, in an efficient way. And we hope to minimize assumptions. Uh, the least uh, number of assumptions, the better. So this is how, how we get randomness in the computers you are, we, we use. Uh, so in Linux, uh, there's a deterministic algorithm sitting in a kernel it will read um, multiple sources and like system boot time and current process ID and uh, some computers have Intel chips that claim to have a circuit uh, dedicated for generating random numbers. And user input, uh, so those are sources of entropy. After collecting those sources, you would uh, try to mix them up and then apply a deterministic uh, stretching function. Whenever uh, your browser or your other application need a random number, it will just read from that pool of random numbers. Um, there's a lot of problems, there are a lot of problems with that. Actually, one, one year, so for, for several years, sorry, for several years, uh, the Derby and Linux uh, only generate 15 bits of randomness. All the keys generated from this Derby and Linux. There are only two, three, fifteen of them. And the reason is because so one kernel developer commented out one line of reading uh, some source of randomness uh, because that line was producing compiler uh, warnings. He didn't like it. Okay. And the result of that is that all the keys, all the DSR the keys, uh, there are only two, three, fifteen of them. <laughs> and um, and another exciting research done by my colleague at Michigan and, and uh, with collaborators, and I think she's at UPenn now. So uh, they downloaded uh, tens of millions of keys from internet, DSA keys, RSA keys. And they broke at least one percent of them. They didn't factor, okay, they didn't have the security efforts of factoring very fast. They just do pairwise uh, GCD, a clever way of, of, of doing that. It turns out that a lot of those keys, they share factors. So therefore, you can do GCD and, and find them. Okay. And the reason why this happened is because there are only a small number of vendors producing those devices, and they all use the same method of generating random numbers. And the end result is that they are n it's not that random. Okay. Okay. So the authors say that uh, their result remind us that uh, random number generation continues to be an unsolved problem uh, in RAN. And the difficulty is that <laughs> you probably have seen this many times. Right? Uh, we just don't know uh, if the output is random, right? If, if, if your random number generator uh, is telling you, okay, if you ask a random number generator, give me a random number, and it just keeps telling you 99999, nine, 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 right? It doesn't look random, but on the other hand, it has the same probability as any other sequence, right? So, how, um, so uh, how, we don't know if the output is random. Um, and it's, it's also a very deep physical question because all the random number generators are going to be run in our physical world. So we are asking a physical question. Uh, are there fundamentally random events uh, in, in our world? Because it's a physics question. And the answer is um, maybe possibly uh, there may not. Right? Because it's possible that the whole world is just deterministic. Uh, the fact I'm speaking here could have been determined in a Big Bang moment. Right? And there's no way we can rule it out. So we have to trust something, we have to believe in something. And the first belief is that uh, there exists uh, some weak form of randomness. You have to make assumptions. So the, the question becomes, what are the minimal assumptions uh, that are needed to make 
to ensure uh, that the output of our random number generator is indeed uh, true randomness. There's a different way of seeing the same question. So uh, extractors, uh, they are precisely the theory, that is precisely the theory for, for doing that task, uh, turning weak randomness to uh, true randomness. Uh, so in this classical theory of extractors, uh, we model uh, weak randomness by uh, this notion of mean entropy. So an extractor is a deterministic algorithm that takes uh, weak sources, uh, weak randomness sources, and convert them to uh, true randomness. And as long as the assumptions are, are met, then the mathematical, mathematical proof would ensure that the output is, is true and random. It's a beautiful theory, and it's still active research. Uh, here's a limitation of the theory. It requires at least two independent sources. Um, so we know if there's only one source going through some deterministic algorithm, there's no hope that we could extract even just one bit. And, and, and that impossibly result holds even if that source is highly random. There's something called thin subvariant source that I'm going to explain later. So even for that very highly, very random source, uh, just one source, you cannot extract even a single bit. We need two sources. And those two sources need to be independent. Okay, two sources and they need to be independent. But there's no way we can check uh, if two sources are independent. Uh, just there's no algorithm for doing that. Uh, be it because, uh, uh, so if you take a convex combination of independent sources, you may get highly correlated uh, input. Yes? Right, definitely, definitely, right. So uh, yeah, if you have additional assumption on the structure of the sources, it's possible. So here I'm trying to deal with arbitrary Wait, you, you addressed it anyway, statistically, right? Not yeah, information theoretical. Right, right exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, there is no contradiction on what you said. Yeah. So, um, it's very natural to think of quantum for a solution. So earlier I pointed out this problem of requiring two independent sources and there's no way to check independence. And a solution for that is to rely on quantum mechanics. Um, so in the axioms of quantum mechanics, there's already uh, built-in randomness. If we prepare a quantum state uh, in a special way and measure it, uh, in another uh, specific way, then the theory uh, guarantees that you get a perfect, uh, perfect coin outcome. And in fact, uh, so this has been used many places, uh, especially in uh, key distributions and unconditionally secure key distribution protocols. And there are even commercial products for generating random numbers using quantum mechanics. So this is a picture taken from a website uh, of this company called uh, ID Quantique, uh, based on Switzerland. It claims to uh, something quantum going on in, inside its chip. And it claims to be generating true randomness. And that passes all randomness tests, which we know there's no <laughs> <laughs> whole collection of uh, randomness uh, tests. And it claimed that uh, this product has been officially certified by some government agency in Switzerland. Okay. But it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. Uh, 
I see. I see. I see. I see. <laughs> Maybe some three letter agency was involved in drafting that requirement. Uh, <laughs> Um, so does this solve our problem? Um, uh, so have you seen a half dead and half a light cat in your life? Uh, so this is the Schrodinger's cat, a very interesting drawing of Schrodinger's cat. Uh, so uh, quantum theory says that uh, it is in this thought experiment, a cat could be in a half dead, half a life uh, state. Um, and when I taught quantum computing for the first time at uh, Michigan, that was uh, uh, many years ago, um, <coughs> a student wrote a very, very interesting uh, poem. Actually, my, my idea of having class poetry was inspired by uh, Sanjeev. And I took his class, and he asked us to write poetry. And I enjoyed that tremendously. I thought that my student would do that, would enjoy that as well. So here's what, what she wrote. Um, a group of physicists performed a hoax about a cat half alive have that in a box. The equation so well worked out, and observations to toot. Only mathematicians fall for such jokes. <laughs> I might have given her A for this point. Yeah. So uh, it points out a problem. How do we know it works? How do we know it works according to specification? So we are classical beings. We can't put our fingers on a chip and feel, oh, this is really a cat state. And we can't do that. And there are situations we may be happily trusting the manufacturer and, and, and uh, or trusting uh, the Swiss government. Actually, uh, I, I was told by someone who knows the company that their product sells very well to casinos. <laughs> and and not because casinos, they're inherently interested in, in uh, making a fair game. Maybe they're interested in making it not fair to you, but they want to claim that they have this uh, fairest uh, random generator uh, for the game play. Right? So the casinos, they will be happily trusting uh, the device. But sometimes we don't. Okay? We don't want to trust it. And even if we are trusting, if we, if we are willing to trust the device and, and the manufacturer and, and the certifying agency, there's still a problem. Uh, we're not sure if the device is reliable. So all the current technologies, they are very prone to noise. So we, are just, we, are just, we can't be sure that uh, the device is working properly. So that brings up a big question. So can we still reap the benefit of quantum information processing without trusting devices? And there's been a lot of work done in, in this area. And the answer is yes, we can. Uh, we don't have to trust it, but we still can work with it and make them work for us. Uh, what I'm going to describe in more details belongs to this area, a uh, very active, uh, actively researched area called untrusted device quantum crypt cryptography. Another terminology for it is uh, device independent uh, quantum cryptography. Now, I, I like untrusted device instead of device independent. At least we still, we still need the devices. So uh, this, this approach, this uh, direction started with uh, questions in quantum key distribution. Um, so it's, it's interesting that uh, this paper by Myers and Yao uh, was written when I was a student and I didn't know much about it. And by 10 plus years later, I started citing it and reading it. Uh, so Myers was a postdoc at uh, Princeton at that time. <clears throat> and then another paper, important paper in 2005, by Ray Hardy and Kent, uh, they came up with a different way of doing uh, quantum key distribution using untrusted quantum devices. And, and it's very different from Myers Yao. And this one is based on uh, so-called uh, Bell test that I'm going to describe. So all the future works are along the lines of uh, Barrett, Hardy, and Kent uh, that I'm going to describe the intuition uh, for that approach. And I should mention that there is a different branch, but within the same umbrella 
of uh, untrusted device quantum information processing. So this different branch, branch is about uh, quantum computation. So um, uh, we, we are classical beings, but we, we want to get a benefit of quantum computation. Uh, somebody else claiming they can do quantum computation. So can we interact with that uh, quantum black box and, 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 and make use of that quantum power, but still we are classical. Okay. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about that, but there's an important paper in that direction, just for your information. Okay, let me be uh, a little bit more specific uh, what I mean by untrusted quantum device. So those black boxes are my joins for uh, the quantum devices. We don't know what's going on, okay? And they came with classical interfaces. So they, they are buttons and, and cranks. You can press buttons and, and, and crank those cranks and get some classical output. And, but the, device, the devices, they may have been prepared by an adversary uh, who may entangle her uh, local system with those quantum devices. Okay. But we, we assume that after we get uh, devices, the adversary cannot communicate uh, with those devices anymore. Otherwise, there's nothing we can do. So, um, and the devices, again, uh, can be imperfect or even malicious. That's the challenge we need to deal with. Next question. Exactly, so they, they could also be entangled with themselves. That's a very good question. But uh, we are going to be requiring that uh, we can impose communication restrictions between different devices. And that's a very important assumption we will make. And that's also a minimal assumption because without those assumptions, we cannot do anything. Because they can, can pre if there's only single, there's, if there's only one single device, and we don't trust the device. They could pre-program uh, whatever is going to make us happy and then uh, trick us into accepting something bad. So we have to make assumptions, something like that. Yes? So that's one way to enforce no communication. Yeah, and uh, in some setting it's effective, uh, but in some setting it may not. Uh, so and <coughs> Right, right, right. So <coughs> if the protocol is going to run for a year, <laughs> and then if you want to use a special relativity to enforce no communication, <laughs> uh, it's going to be a uni universe. It's going to be a, uh, no it's, it's very, yeah, it's like, <laughs> <coughs> it's going to be in a Star Wars, uh, only a principle in Star Wars, yeah. Very good question. I'm going to go to the model of extractor later. Okay. So here I'm just describing uh, the device. So our task is to create and expand true randomness using those untrusted quantum devices. All right, so um, that was my introduction part. Now I'm going to move on to describe what has been done. And in particular, those two problems, randomness expansion and randomness amplification that people have done great works on. And then I'll present a unifying framework uh, for extracting from physical systems. And then I will state our results. So Kobach in his thesis uh, proposed this new direction of randomness expansion. And so the, the journal paper appeared later uh, and uh, Ken is his advisor. So here's a question to consider. Um, we have some untrusted quantum device uh, with some communication restriction. And we start with uh, some number of bits that are perfectly random and do something on it. At the end, we hope to get more randomness out. In other words, the output is going to be very close to uniformly random, even condition on the input. Um, <coughs> so, um, so Kobach uh, in his thesis formulated uh, this direction and proposed some idea. And the mathematical proofs came later. Uh, a few people proved classical security. 
and or maybe security, quantum security, but under some restriction. And one important paper was by Varsanian and Lidic in 2012, and I think uh, Thomas might have given a talk here some time ago now. And so they accomplished something very amazing, two things amazing. Number one is to prove quantum security. So the adversary who uh, has psi information about uh, those devices, in the end, uh, will not know anything about the output. The output is going to be close to uniform random to the adversary. The second amazing thing in this Vazan Vedic work is yes. Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, I was hiding some detail when I say deviation from two randomness. Okay. So what I mean is that, so if I use, use this to denote the system that has this uh, supposedly random strings, and this is the adversary that has some sign information, so, uh, maybe some sign information about x, then I say x is very close to uniform random if the uniform distribution and the local system for adversary. Okay, so this tensor product is very close to the original state. Okay. So that's that's my deviation from uniform. So the second amazing thing proved by Varzani Vedic is that um, we can we can expand the randomness uh, exponentially. So from k bits in the input, the output is going to be exponential in k uh, bits. Okay. Yes. Sure. This is statistical, but uh, taking into Taking into account uh, the adversary, so I want to. So my intuition is, I want to say that the output is uniform to adversary. Earlier, I emphasized that my notion of uniform, or the my notion of randomness, is relative, right? It's relative to somebody, right? So I want to. I want to define what it means for x to be almost uniform to the adversary, and and what it means is that this John system. Imagine some quantity describing. Uh, X and also the adversary. So you can, so th this John system is very close to the ideal world where uh, uh, X is just uniform and tensor product with adversary. So you're not defining the, uh, the quantum distribution of quantum space just right. for, for the Yeah, it's, it's a An engine. Yeah, uh, so I guess is it mainly because that it is not possible to define a unique distribution independent of the adversary? You uh, have to ca take the adversary to when you say what's the distribution of the adversary? Classically, it's, it's probably, mm -hmm. probably possible to say this is the distribution of A, and this is you don't have to mention the adversary. Is that uh, right? I think. I think you're right in the classical case. Uh, so I think in the classical case, those two notions are equivalent. Uh, one is with, without talking about the adversary system. The other is, OK, the conditional, the, condi the notion of conditional mean entropy. I think it, it does not bring any new uh, challenge yeah, in the proof. Anything that proved without considering its adversary, it would just automatically carry over when you have, when you formulate. Yeah. Right, quantumly, yeah, exactly. So, right, classically, yeah, I think that's a very good way of saying it. Classically, you can say condition on the string, the same information the university has, then we can prove some security, right? But here, um, in a sense, it, I, I would say that the, the corresponding way of saying the same thing is precisely this, that now you have, you have this quantum side information, right? Uh, and uh, 
it's different from classical conditionally argument, but this is precisely the, the right way of, of saying it. Okay. Uh, trace distance, yes. Uh, I, I think I should point out there's a subtle difference of this statement and, and, and another statement, which is that when for any measurement of the adversary, the resulting state is random. I think there's some subtle uh, difference, but I can explain to you a subtle difference. But here, I'm, I'm just going to uh, uh, stick with this definition as standard. Uh, usually, people uh, use entanglement to describe uh, two quantum systems uh, having some correlation. So here, we are talking about classical quantum. So it's a classical quantum system. Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not a quantum correlation, uh, but it's some, some kind of in between. Okay. So this is a randomness expansion. We hope to amplify to produce more randomness. Another uh, important uh, topic is randomness amplification. So I'm using the terminology the authors uh, use. So this was proposed by Kobeck and Renner in 2012. It's a much more recent uh, uh, topic. So the big question they ask is, so those are physicists, they ask the question, so are there fundamentally random processes in, in nature? And as I mentioned, we, we need to Assume that there exists weak randomness to start with. And they argue that um, uh, it's appropriate to model weak randomness in nature by what computer scientists uh, call sensor Vazirani source. So you have n bits, and this is a sensor Vazirani source. If every xi has some randomness conditioned on the previous um, outcomes. I, I should have said that condition on x1, x2 up to x, xi minus 1, the next bit uh, is, is 1 with a probability between half minus epsilon and half uh, plus epsilon for a constant epsilon. So if, it, if, if you want to guess the whole string of n bits, uh, the best chance is still 2 to the minus some constant times, c, times n. It's, it's very, very random. So they argue that uh, this is the, uh, uh, they have the reasons to believe that this is a good way to, modif to model uh, weak randomness in, in our physical world. And so Kobeck and Renner proved that when epsilon is small enough, when it's random enough, then they can accomplish the task of extracting, of getting one truly random bit out of the SV source. Okay. And, uh, Uh, it's right, it's right. The, the error is going to depend on epsilon, when epsilon goes zero. It also depends on the number, the n. Uh, when n is big, uh, epsilon is a universal constant. Epsilon is going to be constant. No, they are not independent. They are, sorry, I, I, I omitted some important words. So every xi has some randomness conditioned on the previous bits. This is the example earlier I mentioned that uh, using one single source, you can ex extract even just one bit. You cannot increase randomness more than epsilon bias. So uh, in the original paper, they proved that uh, when epsilon is small enough, then we could get a uh, uh, true random bit out of it. And an important improvement later uh, is that uh, uh, for any constant epsilon, uh, we can always get one bit out. So that's for randomness amplification. Um, so based on those two topics, two uh, lines of research, uh, we see a way to unify them uh, in what we call uh, physical randomness extractor. So a physical randomness extractor 
is a deterministic algorithm. And there are three entities in this picture. The adversary, a classical source, and a set of devices that we don't trust. So the adversary is all-powerful quantum adversary. It prepares the devices, entangle herself with the devices, and entangle the devices among each other. Uh, but we require that after the protocol runs, the adversary cannot communicate with those devices. And we have some communication restrictions on the devices. So the miniature bit source is also created with the adversary and the devices. The sign information uh, resides in the adversary system and also in uh, the devices. So, so you just observe X alone. Uh, no, if you know, so BNHP is in general is, suppose you know the adversary's local system, and you also know all those devices, what's the best chance to predict X? That's what you're looking at. Yes. We don't be on devices. The devices, we have no assumption about them. They can be captured. So if all the devices are broken, the battery is out. So yeah. to the left and finish, the box is the legal output. Right. So, yeah. Good. So it's possible, as you said, that the devices might be uh, broken. <laughs> maybe malicious and maybe, maybe broken. So therefore, the extractor is going to interact with them. And in some situation, it will reject. It will say, oh, you are broken. Oh, you are trying to check me. Okay. So the protocol is not guaranteed to succeed all the time. So uh, basically, there are two kinds of errors we're going to fight with. One kind of error is, what if those are malicious or not working? So the chance of accepting something that's bad. So this is a soundness error. We need to minimize that error. Another type of error is, uh, what if they are honest? Then we don't want to wrong them. Right? The chance of rejecting uh, honest imp imp implementation is the completeness error. That's another error we're going to minimize. So expansion and amplification, there are special cases of this framework. So for expansion, it simply means that this is perfectly random. There's no correlation between the adversary and the source. It's globally random. So it's a seeded, it's seeded extraction. We have uniform C. Amplification in, in those uh, physics authors' uh, definition, they are our physical extractors where the source, our SV source. And there they go is the upper one, one bit. I guess they, they, they don't like operating more. They, they, just, they can only accomplish operating one bit. And if you want to have more bits, then the parameter just uh, becomes so bad. So um, the earlier terminologies of expansion and amplification seem to suggest that the randomness in the output, they come from the input uh, miniature source. And we feel that uh, uh, a more appropriate view is that the randomness come from the devices. But that's already in context, so it's like the randomness comes from the device. That's why, that's why he said Thanks for pointing out. And the role of the classical source is to prevent cheating. Uh, we need to make sure that there's something that devices don't know. And, and, and that's, that's this uh, miniature source. The role is to prevent cheating. I'm sorry? Uh, OK, in what sense is classical? Um, <coughs> So they are, uh, um, I guess classical is just quantum, but uh, I guess uh, uh, they, they are distributions on a fixed basis. Um. It's a condition on all the other things, it's just a distribution. Yeah, it's just distribution, so right, right. So if you throw away, if you throw away all the quantum systems, what is left? 
each diagonal is, is, is a distribution of some specific uh, base, basis that we would choose. Uh, um, let's say mathematically I required, um, I'm not sure what's the, okay. Um, right, so uh, yeah, you can say, you, um, well you can always measure in different bases, but it's not gonna be, uh, it will be just the same as uh, choosing randomly some classical string and then measure that classical string in a quantum uh, measurement. You, you, can, you still can try that, <coughs> but uh, I guess uh, uh, it's just a, I specify. Uh, like first I choose a canonical basis for Hilbert space. And, and of course, so all quantum states are matrices uh, using uh, this basis. But uh, uh, by saying classical, what I mean is this very special matrix is a diagonal matrix. Uh, mathematically, uh, is a, that's what it means. Uh, right, so this base is fixed. We, we, we choose a canonical basis. Yes. <clears throat> so the, the goal is for uh, physical structure is the following. We want to accomplish quantum security. The output should be close to uniform with respect to reversal. Uh, the up, first, I, I want to point out the output is not going to be uniform with respect to devices, because you get them from devices. But uh, uh, our goal is to make them uniform with respect to reversal. And we want to minimize error. And I mentioned this completeness error is the chance of rejecting honest implementations. And soundness error is the chance of accepting undesirable outputs. And we hope to get long outputs. We hope to extract all randomness in the devices and I, I add quote unquote all because it's not clear yet at this point what quantifies the full amount of randomness that one can extract. So that's an important open problem. What exactly is, this, what exactly describes uh, the maximum amount of uh, randomness in a device that we can extract from? Um, and the classical source, we hope to be able to cope with arbitrary uh, mean entropy source, s a s a smaller, um, then we can cope with the better. Question? Yes. So this adversary, have you added it to the model just because your proof also works for adversaries? Or is it sort of an important part? It's very important because that's, that's where the challenge is. It's usually not no, no, hard. No, I understand that's maybe the challenge is so yeah. if this adversary was not there, it would be much easier? It's much easier, yeah. Okay. It'll be well, what must it be that you can remove the adversary and just tell us and say that the devices are in terms of being an arbitrary way? Yes. Say it again. You could have removed the adversary and just said that you only have devices that are entangled in an arbitrary way. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that. But it, it's it's not. I mean, it, it's it's much easier. But that doesn't mean it's automatically. Uh, no, we we see, still need. So, for instance, hmm. uh, you get the chips from the Swiss company, right? Right. You are putting them yourself, right? Yeah. In whatever condition. Right. It's really. I mean, there's no entanglement. Right. I mean, the Swiss company is in Switzerland, right? You are putting right. them where you are. Right putting whatever cages around there. There's no entanglement. Yeah, up, up, up. Um, you, you want mm. to trust the, the Swiss uh, government? No. <laughs> so if you don't trust But there's, them, no, there's, no, there's no entanglement. So, um, all right, so, um, okay, let, 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 me, let, me, let me address uh, Sanjeev's question. So uh, the reason why you feel there's no entanglement is because it's too far away. Is that, is that, is that, is that what makes you Not feel that? Not too far away, you know? Yeah. These are arbitrary chips, they're too right. vast, right? right. Right. Which you you plug them where you want it. Right. Right. And right. you put a priority cage or whatever around right. them. Right. 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 Uh, mm -hmm. Why yeah. do you mm -hmm. that the Swiss government is so so smart that they can figure all this out and entangle them? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure about Swiss government, but how about the company that produced these chips? And yeah, no, I right. Yeah. So so they <laughs> so when they when they manufacturing uh, manufacture those chips. Uh, in a lab, they could have entangled uh, the chip with their oh. how They were powered uh, down for a year, and then you put them in some arbitrary place. Well, you uh, certainly be out there one hmm. on each, uh, you know, one chip on each device. What's the problem? At room temperature. Right. Or, la 
which last for you? Uh, yeah, I, I think, okay, I'm, no, sure. Let me, let, let, let me take, take, take uh, okay, let, let me make sure that, yeah, let me be conservative. Um, what I'm saying is that it's, you always have to distrust them. I mean, there are situations, yeah. you're fine, right? I, it's perfectly fine. Yeah. It's, it's always, and maybe 99.999% of situation, well, it's, it's gonna work out very well, okay. And, uh, but uh, in a situation, some situations maybe we don't wanna trust them. And furthermore, another motivation for this work, for this area, as I mentioned earlier, besides this trust issue, there's also uh, what if the device is not perfect? So what if because of the technology, it's going to isn't after a year, you keep it for a year, maybe that's going to help you uh, 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 building your confidence. But on the other hand, you know, the device a might year was arbitrary, right? Right. A second is no right. Problem. Right. So so the point is that maybe maybe device. Uh, is corrupted uh, during the shipment, yes. and so that becomes uh, imperfect. And you are not sure it's going to work well, that's right? Fine. So, so no, that's that's yeah. different from saying there's an arbitrary arbitrary. That's what I mean. Uh, is there no, no simpler way to sure. work this? Sure, no, sure, uh, sure, sure. Uh, mm. uh, mm -hmm. It's essential that this device is without entanglement. Otherwise, they will never be able to generate any randomness. Uh, yes. I think Sanjeev is talking about adversary, not, yeah, no, not the intra-device, right? No, I, I think I think Sanjeev, uh, it, it makes sense to model uh, uh, how the device get corrupted. Maybe some more realistic setting. So uh, I think it makes sense to model uh, uh, decoherence, so the interaction of the device with the environment in a more realistic setting. That's possible, that's, and that's meaningful. And here I'm taking the worst case. Suppose this process of being corrupted is in the adversarial situation, we can still prove strong results. And that will cover that uh, more specific physical uh, modeling. But I think that kind of work uh, is, has value as well. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And so therefore, uh, putting, pushing that argument further, the casino could say, all right, we have the, those protocols, and even the devices are corrupted, we can still guarantee you the true random, true random. All right, so let me continue with the model. And all right, uh, I think I have, I have mentioned most of it. Okay. Oh, so I already talked about that. Okay, so uh, in this model, sorry, um, so I, th I think one, one benefit of formulating uh, this, this model, even though it's basically based on previous uh, two lines of research, one benefit of putting them together is that uh, it allows us to describe the multiple parameters and to try to understand, to raise new questions about the relationship between among those parameters. So what are those parameters? We want to have corner security, small error, right? We talk about that in upper length and uh, and here's a new, here's a, li a list of uh, premium goals and more important goals for practical uh, implementation. The first one is robustness. We hope that the devices, they don't need to be perfect. Uh, we hope that there's some constant, universal constant neighbor noise that uh, they are allowed uh, 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 to have and still the outcome is good. And we also want to minimize the quantum memory required. Uh, so as Avi pointed out, the, the device is supposed to entang be entangled. That's how they could generate um, <coughs> randomly. So uh, they can be super classical. And we know it's very hard at this current it's very hard to store quantum states for a long time. So we hope to 
uh, minimize the requirement on quantum memory. And we don't want to use too many devices because it's going to increase the complexity of enforcing no communication. And we want the whole process to be computationally efficient. So therefore, our, our task is to construct physical extractors with optimal parameters, hopefully simultaneously optimizing everything. Okay, that's not accomplished yet. That's the main of our problem. So now I'm, I'm ready to state our results. Um, so the two results, one is seeded extraction, the other is seedless extraction. So for seeded extraction, we can use two devices. We transform k bits to exponential in k bits out. And it's quantum secure. So those features match what uh, Vazinani and Vidic accomplished in 2012. So the new features are the following. We accomplish cryptographic level of security meaning the error is negligible in the running time. So the error is going to be exponential in uh, inverse exponential in polylog of the upper length. So in previous work, the error is only inverse polynomial of the upper length. Uh, there's a trade-off between T and C. You can make T arbitrarily large. When you make T large, C is going to be small. And our protocol, or our analysis, allows the devices to be noisy. Now, the devices can be a constant uh, noise, at a constant no uh, level of noise. So previous work required the device is going to be perfect when the number runs. When n goes through, when n is big, the device has to be almost perfect. And we allow unit-sized quantum memory. So the devices, they need only to store one qubit. And once that is consumed, they are allowed to communicate to establish a new pair of qubits. Um, so in previous work, uh, the device need to store a uh, polylog uh, number of uh, qubits. And there are different uh, games or building blocks we can choose in constructing our protocol. So previous work requires some specific uh, building block. And the proof is just completely different. So let's for seated extraction. For seedless extraction, so let me remind you, this is the situation that uh, we, don't, uh, we, don't, we don't have any perfect randomness to start with. What we have is a single, uh, single mean HP source. And in our construction, this mean HP source can be known to adversary, uh, meaning that uh, the mean entropy is with respect to the devices. So if you, if you have the device, then you have some limitation of predicting what the source is. And it could be arbitrarily small. A constant amount of mean entropy is fine. So small meaning a lot of, like k being an absolute constant or k? K could be a constant. It, so when n grows, when the length grows, k could remain as a constant. That's the exactly, exactly. So K, the mean entropy is going to determine, it, it, it's going to impose a, a limit on the error because if the device gets correctly, the input, then the output is not going to random. So it's going to impose a limit. And we can achieve almost that limit. So the whole thing is, is so basically what we accomplish is a reduction of seedless extraction to seeded extraction. Okay. So seeded extraction syntactically is easier because you have uniform seed. Right? Seed is syntactically is harder. And here we, what we did is a reduction of this harder problem to this easier problem. Okay. So we can use, we can plug in different seed extraction protocol. If we use uh, the protocol I just talked about, then the whole thing will tolerate constant noise. And there's a trade-off between error and the number of devices. And this is where future work uh, needs to look into, uh, optimizing this trade-off. Uh, if we don't care about the number of devices, then the error can be made close to optimal. But uh, if we want to minimize the number of devices, the error could be very bad. Okay, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's a drawback of our limitation of our, of our result. So, um, 
there are a, a few applications. Uh, let me mention at least uh, three. One is robust unbounded expansion. So uh, what is unbounded expansion? The goal is this. We start with some k bits. And in the end, we want to get arbitrary n bits out. And n it has no relation with k. So this is trivial if we simply concatenate an exponentially expanding protocol. So this one maps k to exponential k. And next time, it's going to be double exponential in k, and then triple exponential. So using log star n devices, we can accomplish um, unbound expansion. It's not surprising. Okay. So unbound expansion itself is not surprising. Oh, a good question. So the error, because every time the error is exponentially, is exponential function, inverse exponential. So therefore, um, it's, it's shrinking very fast. So the error is going to be dominated by the first error. Okay. That's why when we do one shot expansion, the error is very important. Okay. Because error sticks there. It's decreasing, so in the end, it's dominated by the first error. So remember, the error is exponentially small in input. So therefore, here the error is double exponential small in input. So, um, right, so putting log star n devices together, uh, we get trivial unbound expansion. And if we use uh, the robust protocol, then we get robust unbound expansion. So the, the really uh, interesting question is, can we reduce the number of devices uh, to constant? I, we may argue that it may be log star n and constant doesn't differ much in reality. But theoretically, uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, so Fair and co-authors, they raise this question. Can we reduce the number of devices to a constant by cross-feeding the output of a protocol uh, to another? So the output of this protocol, use that as the input uh, to the next protocol. And then use the output of this as the input of the first protocol. So let's keep doing this. Right? Can we, so in this way, we don't need to use too many devices, and can we accomplish um, unbound expansion? This is probably a folklore. Uh, a lot of people thought about this bef even before this paper. We thought about it before. So Ku and Yuan were the first to say, yes, we can do that uh, using the, this cross-feeding protocol. And they managed to accomplish unbounded expansion using eight devices. And the protocol, unfortunately, is not robust because it's based on uh, the Vasiani Vitic protocol, which is not robust. Uh, in addition uh, to this paper, earlier I mentioned this, this is about uh, dedicated uh, quantum computation. Uh, it turns out to provide a very useful tool uh, for this purpose. So our two papers put together, it implies that, in fact, this works. And on any Exponential in, on any protocol that we have proved to be secure, then you can just do this. And, um, and therefore, uh, any protocol that you have proved to be secure, double the number, double the number of devices, they give you a unbound expansion uh, protocol. And if, if this protocol is robust, then the composi composition is also robust. So when I say four devices, I implicitly imply that they are not supposed to communicate. Uh, but of course, when, this, when you're running this protocol, these two themselves can talk to each other. Yeah. That, that doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah, OK. So number of devices translate to uh, communication restrictions. And we can put those two protocols together. Uh, the C-list extraction and C-list extraction. So we start with mean entropy source do the C-list extraction, and then do unbound expansion. So the end result is that we can start with arbitrary mean entropy source, single one. And we can, we can get an unbounded number of upper bits out. So uh, another important context, an uh, important problem for uh, untrusted quantity device cryptography is key distribution. So here, um, Alice and Bob, they want to establish some secret by talking to each other through a public channel. 
So we are assuming that they can authenticate each other. So they know, they know that they're, they're talking to each other. And the challenge is that uh, the adversary now may listen to their conversation. So therefore, classically, it's impossible for Edison Bob to uh, do key distribution information theoretically. And there are quant there were quantum protocols that are secure if you trust the quantum operations. So that was actually the main, the most important application, one of the most important applications of quantum information processing to do unconditionally secure quantum key distribution. Um, so Vazanovic did in a different paper, uh, they proved that we can do quantum key distribution without trusting devices. And it's robust, uh, the devices can be noisy. And that's a very important paper. So the new result that we have is uh, the Munich protocol. We can translate that to the context of key distribution, and we can match the result of Vazir and Vedic uh, for robustness and security. At the same time, we can do exponential expanding of the keys. So they can start with a very short key, probably log of the upper length, and the end up with uh, very long keys. In their paper, uh, the, upper, the, the, the security to start with has to be linear of the upper length. Okay, so in a setting that uh, randomness is very, very precious, then this could be useful. So um, I'm going to quickly mention, I already uh, used up one hour time. I will quickly describe the methods. Yeah. Um, so all those protocols, they share the same foundation. The foundation is uh, how do we know it's quantum? Okay. And the strategy for doing that is what I call a, a quantum test of, a classical test of a quantum duck. So if, if it looks like quantum, uh, and it behaves like quantum, then it's probably quantum. So uh, we are going to interact with the devices classically, and we check if their behavior uh, is super classical. And we hope that those tests have the following property. If the devices behave uh, exactly as ideal, then they must be ideal devices. And furthermore, we actually need a stronger property of that. If the devices behave very close to the idea, then inside the boxes must be very close to the idea of strategy. Okay. So that's, that's the foundation of those work. And there are some specific, specific game for testing that. And I, I'm putting Einstein here because uh, he's saying uh, there's no communication allowed between those two devices. And so this is the building block. So those kind of tests are building blocks for all those work. Um, so here's the game. Uh, this device gets input bit X and output a bit A, and this device gets input bit Y and outputs a bit D. And the, the devices win if the parity, the XOR of these two bit is the end of the input bit. So under uniform distribution of the input, and it turns out that quantum beats classical. Quantum has a higher winning strategy. And I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna move on. And one important thing is that the optimal quantum strategy has the following property. Um, and the property is that uh, any quantum strategy achieving close to uh, that quantum winning chance must be very close to the idea. And, and furthermore, in any optimal, in the, in the unique quantum optimal strategy, the output A of device A is uniform to all other devices, to uniform to all except except to the devices. The device A, of course, know, knows its output, and device B knows a little bit about the, out the output. But other than these two devices, the output A is uniform to all in the optimal quantum strategy. And it's also very important that uh, it doesn't matter what input is. If the input is zero, zero, the output A is still gonna be uniform. And that's a, I'm not gonna go into details of why it's true, uh, uh, but the reason for this is for this is because of this, this property of entanglement called uh, monogamy of entanglement. So if the two devices are in the uh, maximally entangled states, then they cannot be in any quantum correlation with outside world. Um, 
So, so, um, so that game suggests an idea to certify something quantum is going wrong. The idea is that we just run this game sequentially many times, and we record the winning percentage, and to see if it's higher, much higher than the classical. This is the optimal classical strategy, it's a classical prob winning probability. If statistically it wins much higher than classical optimal, then it must be quantum. And that's something is going wrong in you know, our experiment. Those are called loopholes. And for example, it's possible that uh, in experiment, uh, actually, it's no one. Uh, there's n it's very hard to close that loop. So uh, when you're doing experiment, uh, uh, we may not detect. We may not detect some photon. We may not complete some measurement accurately. And there's also freedom of choice loophole, meaning that if the input is not uniform random, then uh, the game will fail to distinguish, distinguish quantum classical. And this is relevant to us because when we don't have uh, true randomness to start with, we run into a problem of there's no way. We, we, we don't know how to plug in random enough test, uh, random enough inputs to do the test. OK, so, um, so what I described earlier was basically a standard experiment for uh, for uh, 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 witnessing quantum entanglement, uh, the physicists are doing. So how can we make use of those for random expansion? Uh, there's a problem I mentioned earlier that uh, we can separate classical and quantum only when the input is close to uniform. So therefore, if we just play this game over and over use with uniform input, we are consuming too many input bits. We can accomplish ex exponential expanding. So um, the solution is that it's the mixed uh, work and play. And uh, what I mean by work is, is to generate randomness without consuming randomness with, with fixed input. Uh, earlier I mentioned that the optimal strategy, the output is still random, even the input is fixed. Right? So this, that's work. And play is just to do this test with the uniform input bits. And so we, if we mix them in a way that the device do not know when uh, it's playing or, 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 or working, then, um, then we can accomplish expansion because if the device is trying to avoid work, it may risk failing the test. So the input to each device uh, have intersections. So zero, when input is zero, it could be, could be working or it could be one quarter chance, or actually half the chance in, in the, uh, in the test round. So those protocols, they all uh, share the same structure. We play sequentially uh, many games, and we choose a small number of games for testing. And, and in this paper, Kuja and Ryan and Vitek, uh, uh, they use, they flip coins, uh, and P is a very small number. And if P is one, you use this round for, for testing, and, and, and otherwise you, uh, you fix the input zero, zero uh, to the device. Okay. And we look at how many test rounds are failed and reject if that uh, number is too high. So uh, for seed extraction, okay, so that what I described earlier was uh, the intuition and was the foundation for all those works and was, was in the previous work. Now in our work, the challenge, we have four challenges in our work uh, for seed expansion. The first challenge is the device is adversarial. And uh, it could be arbitrary, right? So the one important idea that we came up with is it turns out that uh, uh, the two devices we are using, even though they're arbitrary, but we are using them in a specific way. We have some pre-processing of the input, and we have some post-processing of the output. Composing this pre and post processing with the two devices, we get a, a, a bigger device, and this bigger device turns out always have a trusted component. Okay. So we call this forcing trust. So the pre and post processing forces all devices to have a trusted component. And what, what I mean by trusted component is, um, when we decide this is testing round, the device, this composed 
mega device does some fixed measurement. And then when we choose it to be uh, so testing wrong and the other one is working wrong, then the mega device, the trusted mega device, does another measurement. And these two measurements, the anti commute. Okay. Some very specific way of of, of measuring. Okay. And so so it's a very important step in our work to prove that even though device is arbitrary, but because of pre and post processing, we can be sure that uh, uh, this mega device has certain honest components in it. So therefore, we are left with two things. One is to argue that if you have honest measurement device, how do you generate randomness? And then later, we take care of uh, the noise. So the second uh, challenge is that so the devices, they may fail in different places, in different paths. So device, the devices uh, may, may generate randomness uh, at wrong 100 in its paths and, and, and later at wrong 1,000. But in the different outcomes of the measurement, it may produce randomness in different places. So we don't have an even process of generating randomness. So an important idea is that uh, uh, in a more computer science terminology, we amortize the process of generating randomness. So when a device fails the test, it may not generate randomness. So suppose the device is in a state that, that if you use it to test, it's going to fail. And if you use to, so therefore, the consequence of that is if you use that for generating randomness, the output is not very good. And the, the solution we came up with is that if a device is failing the test, we actually flip a coin, uh, kind of hypothetically. We insert some randomness into the process so that when, when, when in that step, there's, there's, it's not producing enough randomness. We actually give it some randomness. And the benefit of that is that we, we can argue that every step, we have some constant randomness out, even though those, some, some randomness is borrowed from our bank. And we argue that uh, at the end, the total amount of known is not too much. So therefore, there's still a lot of randomness generated. And um, the third challenge is to quantify randomness. And uh, it's not obvious how to do that. And we make use of a notion called uh, quantum Rennie divergence. And then we need to bound the randomness generated uh, in terms of the quantum Rennie divergence, or a related quantity at each, every step. And for that, uh, we need to have a, we, we, we use a new um, uncertainty principle for doing that. And I'm going to actually jump to uh, the last, um, a summary page of the technique. Um, so, so those two works involve many different pieces of the puzzle. Uh, earlier I talked about um, the four uh, challenges face that we face in, in seed extraction. So another challenge, the, the, so the main challenge in the seedless extraction is, the first one is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the foundation of all those work is to do those quantum versus classical test, right? And those tests require uniform input. So the challenge of that is we, we don't have those uniform input to do a test. And one strategy to deal with that is uh, in this notion of quantum somewhere randomness. And uh, this is not completely new. In a classical setting, uh, we, if you have extractor, we can enumerate all the seed. And then what we get is that we have a, a many blocks of output, and we know one block is random. We don't know where it is, right? Uh, so it's the same idea, actually. This is the place where uh, we use uh, uh, your work uh, 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 for quantum proof uh, classical extractor. So we, we enumerate all the C's, and, and we know we have some perfect randomness somewhere, but we don't know where it is. Okay. So this somewhere quantum randomness provides uh, the input for doing a test. And then the next challenge is um, we need to compose we need to compose those seeded extractors together. Uh, and, and, 
and composition security is the, is the challenge. And it turns out that, uh, 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 so what we know, what we know is we have a lot of, we have some options for those seeded, seeded extractions, including uh, this robust protocol of uh, Miller Xi. But those protocols, they are proved under a very strong assumption. The, the strong assumption is that the input is random to all. Okay. But in our setting, we don't have that global uniform randomness. We only have local uniform randomness. And it turns out that uh, uh, those uh, global randomness is equivalent to local randomness for those protocols. That's why we call it equivalence lemma. It turns out that uh, uh, there's no problem of comp uh, composing those uh, protocols together. I want to conclude with two open problems. Um, the first one is, is there a perfect physical extractor? Uh, what I mean is that uh, it should optimize all the parameters simultaneously. Okay. Um, it, it can deal with arbitrary mean HP source. It is robust. It minimizes the number of devices. Uh, I don't know what is the minimum number. Uh, maybe two for exponential expansion. Uh, maybe three for unbound expansion. And it should get all the randomness out. Again, I don't know what quantifies all the randomness. Okay, um, so minimizing all the payment, uh, optimizing all the parameters in our framework. So these two works, they, they optimize different sets of parameters. Uh, basically, the question is, can we accomplish uh, the string in both work in one single uh, protocol? And a bigger question is, I suspect there is a very general principle so that uh, for a very broad class of protocols, as long as you prove the classical security, which is much easier, then that principle would automatically translate the security proof to a quantum security proof. And Alinja probably had experience of, work, of seeing those extractors being uh, translated from classical security to quantum security. And I suspect that uh, uh, there's a very broad principle. Uh, uh, and that why you did uh, maybe a special case of that broad principle. And I don't know what the principle is, and, but I believe that it's probably there. I think I'm a, I will stop here. Uh, okay, thank you.